Good morning. Today is the 20th day of Tammuz, the 9th of July. And we're switching to another double parsha, Matot Masei. Uh, Matot literally means the staffs, meaning the heads of the tribes, and Masei is the journeys. And these two parashot in general have a lot to do with the uh, uh, psychology. Um, just as an introduction, we'll say that in the second parsha, Masei, the journeys, we hear about the 42 journeys that the Israelites went through in the wilderness. And the Baal Shem Tov was very fond of saying that every individual in their lives goes through these, the equivalent of these 42 journeys in life. And we'll have more time to speak about that later on in the week. Let's focus now on the first reading. The first reading, reading contain, contains two issues. The first one is the one that we'll talk about more right now, is that of the vows made by uh, individuals and how they are taken care of and why they need to be taken care of in general. And then the second issue, which is in the first reading, is the war against uh, Midian, or at least the beginning of the war against uh, Midian. And maybe we'll talk more about that tomorrow because it spills over into the second reading. So let's talk about the, the vows. I, I want to read a little bit and then just so that we get some idea about what's going on and then uh, talk about it a little bit. Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes, meaning to the staffs of the tribes of the Israelites, saying, this is what God has commanded. If an adult man, meaning someone over tw- a tw- 12 years old, makes a vow to God, here is 12 years old, notice, it's not 13, because even somebody who's uh, over 12, who's close to being 13, and already understands who the vow is being made to, because the vow is made in the name of God, if he understands who God is, um, his vows are already uh, valid. So if an adult man over 12 years old makes a vow to God or makes an oath to prohibit himself from doing something otherwise permitted by the Torah, so he must, must not profane his word, meaning he, he cannot break his word. And he must fulfill whatever he said. Uh, people made vows because they wanted an extra degree of uh, piety. Or, as we'll see in a moment, uh, there were other reasons. We'll, we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper into the reasons for that. In any case, if a woman makes a vow to God or imposes a prohibition, and they're... Um, when she is under 11 years old in her father's house, if she's over 11 years old, again, her vow will already uh, be valid without her father agreeing to it. And she is in her father's house in her youth. If her father heard her vow or her prohibition that she imposed upon herself, yet her father remains silent, meaning he confirms her vow or her oath, all her vows will be binding, and any prohibition that she has imposed upon herself will be binding. So we start with, the, first of all, with the man, and then the second uh, individual is the, is the woman who's under the age of 11. But if her father hinders her on the day that he hears the vow being made by annulling it, all her vows and her prohibitions that she has imposed upon herself will not be binding. God will forgive her because her father hindered her. And then it goes on with a, a number of other uh, situations in which uh, people make vows, uh, and how they can be annulled. Now, the way that the Talmud, there's a whole tractate in the Talmud, tractate Nedarim, which is uh, dedicated to this topic. And from the very first words, and Moses spoke this to the head of the tribes, the Talmud learns that the heads of the tribes, which are really the heads of the courts of law, they also have a role in the vows and in these uh, oaths. And so, let me just read the commentary. Having mentioned vows in the preceding laws, um, you know what, I don't know if he explains it here, I'll just explain it by heart, that because the heads of the tribes are here mentioned, so we learn something even more important, that the court of law, meaning if you go to a court, and you say to them, I made a certain vow, for instance, I, I said I would not eat, um, you know what, I would never again talk to someone <laughs> um, or to some specific individual. Or, for instance, this is very common, people do this all the time, so I'll never speak to you again. Um, 
or you made a, a, a an oath or a vow. In English, the two words sound exactly the same to me. In, in Hebrew, they're very different. Neder and the shvua. Uh, shvua is that I, I make a uh, a a a oath about some something, and neder is uh, sorry about myself, and neder is that I make an oath about some object. So, in other words, if I say I will never again eat watermelon. And so that is a nedo. That's that's a, a, because I'm saying I will never eat watermelon again. If I say watermelons from now on are prohibited for me, I'm not saying anything about myself. I'm saying it about the watermelon. That's called a shua. That's called a note. In any case, uh, there's a lot of discussion about the differences. What I want to get at is that the court of law always has an ability to annul a vow or an oath that a person took. And you have to understand that this is also a very powerful tool, which is positive. How could it be positive? Because a person wants to force themselves to do something. Um, how do you force yourself today in the 20s and 21st century to do something? It's very hard. Uh, you set up some reminder, you set up a schedule, you set up this, you set up that. But there's no religiously binding way to force yourself to follow a certain course of action. Let's say someone who wants to lose weight. So with the Torah, you can literally impose on yourself like a, a prohibition that doesn't exist in the Torah, and it becomes religiously binding. And it's something that's very powerful in that sense. It gives you a lot of strength to actually carry through with what you intended to do. So it's a very powerful tool when used the right way. The problem is, and this is this is what the Torah is talking about here, is that most of the time, um, people would use this because of some fantasy in their mind. Meaning it wasn't, again, like, like I said, I'm never going to talk to you again. I'm never going to eat watermelon again. All these things which are a complete exaggeration. They have nothing to do with actual reality, but people do say these things. And when they say them, they become legally binding. Now, if you go to a, a, a court of law, they have the ability to look for an opening, it's called. What is the opening? The opening comes and says, did you think about such and such a situation when you made your vow? Meaning, in other words, if you would have known that you, would have, you had to speak to this person because you needed to talk to them about something very important and so on and so forth, would you have made that vow? And then that becomes an opening because you say, no, I didn't think about that. I didn't think about that situation. So what the court has the power to do is actually to figure out what you were imagining in your mind. Now, if you think about this a little bit, it's not very hard to see that this is exactly the root of all psychology. The root of all psychology is trying to figure out what a person has in his mind when he thinks one thing or another thing. And the court has this um, duty to help people straighten out their minds. And this is the source, really the, the Torah source for all uh, uh, psychology, in the sense that, for instance, uh, Rav Nachman of Breslov says that the evil inclination is the imagination itself. It's actually the f not fully thought out um, um, and very, um, very haphazard very um, spontaneous reaction to things. Those, those types of reactions they need, at least at the behavioral side, but all, at the behavioral level, but also at the emotional level, they need a wise person to, speak, to, to work them out, to figure them out, so that a person can come and say to you, look, you haven't thought it completely, completely through. And if you would have thought it completely through, you would have seen that there were other sides to the situation and not the sides that you thought about. This itself is the very uh, uh, root of psychological uh, uh, therapy in Torah. In other words, we don't come to the person and say, oh, what an idiot you are that you did so and so. We don't say to them, uh, you're completely wrong. On the contrary, we accept the situation, but we said the situation is not complete in your mind. You weren't able to cover all the circumstances. And, and now we're helping you to understand the full picture. And when you understand the full picture, things come into context. 
And when they come into context, that's called that we found an opening, and you find a way to regret or to go back on your decisions in the past, to go back on the way that you saw the world, to change the way that you saw the world, the way that you change, that, that you see yourself. And these things are done here. Uh, as it, it, it's literally the, the meaning here, and the whole tractate in the Talmud is based on this. It's trying to understand how does a person's thought process work? How does their imagination work? How do we figure out how to fix it so that they can have a free life, one that is not governed by their false imagination, by the wrong, uh, by, by these things that they've sort of dug themselves into and can't, can't get themselves out of. So this is uh, one of the most important uh, 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 sections in the Torah from a psychological point of view. Um, later in the Parsha, we'll see also another example of this uh, in a different direction, but also with the same idea that people come with certain, certain ideas in their mind, and we need to try to figure out what in the world they meant and help them organize their thoughts. So thank you very much, thank you very much for joining today, and I hope to see you tomorrow, and we'll talk about the war against Midian, which is a tremendously important topic in uh, Hasidic thought. So have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye.